Great. Okay. So we're going to start the meeting now. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to DCA Delta Stakeholders Engagement Committee. And it's being held via teleconference, Ring Central, on Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. I am Chair Sarah Palmer. And thank you for joining us. And we appreciate your taking your time uh, to participate in this process and provide your thoughts on ways we can provide a community focus on the engineering aspects of a proposed conveyance project. So could we have a roll call, please? Of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Chair Palmer. Oh, here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Keegan. You know, she did mention that she was gonna be a little late, so um, we'll circle back to her. Committee member Swenson. I know I saw you. I'm here. Thank Committee you. member Whaley. Committee member Berrigan Priya. Committee member Giacomo. Here. I'm Committee here. member Glosky. Here. Committee member Welch. Committee member Shia. I see him right there. Present, present. <laughs> Thanks, Douglas. Committee member Marino. Committee member Cosio. Here. Committee member Gonzalez Potter. You know, she actually just emailed me having trouble getting in, so we'll we'll circle back to her as well. Committee member Cox. Here. Committee member Tarango. Committee Here. member Mann. Oh, thanks, Jesus. Committee member Mann. Committee member Liebig. Committee member Lytle. Committee member Moran. Here. Committee member Tayaba. Committee member Merlo. Committee member Hardesty. Here. All right, let me just circle back around. Um, committee member Whaley. Committee member Berrigan Priya. Committee member Welch. Committee member Marino. Committee member Gonzalez Potter. Committee member Mann. Committee member Liebig. Committee member Lytle. Committee member Tayaba. Committee member Merlo. Right, so let me. And Jasmine, this is Barbara Keegan, and I'm here. Thank you. All right, we have a quorum. Thank you. Great. Okay, then uh, let's go on, and I'm going to start my introductory remarks. And what we'll do is we'll lay out the the ground rules again, which you've all heard, but we will do this again. So, uh, this meeting is being conducted via Ring Central and teleconference to ensure we are adhering to the requirements related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The purpose of the SEC is to create a forum for Delta stakeholders to provide input and feedback on technical and engineering issues related to DCA's current activities. The SEC is the formal advisory body to the DCA Board of Directors. It is subject to the public transparency laws applicable to local public agencies like the Brown Act and the Public Records Act. It's important to note that participation in this SEC does not in any way indicate support by its members of any Delta conveyance system. So the practices for the virtual meeting is that this discussion process and public comment periods will remain consistent with past meetings. So for SEC comments and questions um, during the discussion portion of our meeting, the SEC members will use the raise hand function. If you go down to the bottom and you've got the, the, if you pull up the participants list, you'll see there's a raise hand function. So if you could use that, that would be great. And we'll keep track of that. So you use the raise hand function within the ring central and Ms. Martinez will call the name of the SEC member to make a comment or ask a question. As in past meetings, SEC members will have complete control of their video and audio at all times. We request that you keep your video on to make for a better meeting. 
but I understand that you may have to turn it off if you're having some kind of a connection problem because sometimes you can you can hear better and speak better when you have the video off. So use your judgment on that one. We also ask that everyone mute themselves when not talking to eliminate unintended background noises. Uh, public comment and given this ring platform, attendees will be muted and not have a video option unless they are speaking during public comment. This is for the public, not for the FC members. At that point, we will mute, unmute you and it will be up to the speakers whether or not they activate their video. And if you would, that'd be great. If you wish to provide public comment on agenda items, please complete the online public comment form by 4 p.m. The link can be found on the dcdca.org website on the SEC agenda. Once we get to the end of each agendized item in the meeting, our facilitator, Valerie Martinez, will call out to each person to speak. The line will be opened and the speaker will provide comments. We will follow the same process for public comment on non-agendized items. And I believe unless we have many, many, we have about a three minute limit on the public comment. So please keep yourself within that time frame. The public may also provide written public comment by email on public comment, all one word. So public comment at dcdca.org. All written comments received prior to the conclusion of the meeting will be included in the written record for the meeting, but they will not be read during the meeting, but they will be included. So next, we are getting on to the minutes review. And so does anyone have any changes or comments or questions about the minutes? And you have until Friday to make adjustments by sending those to Jasmine Runquist. So do we have any comments or changes? We did receive one um, comment via email for Douglas that we will be um, correcting and implementing into the minutes. Great. Can you can, is it a big one? Can you tell us what it is? I'm so sorry, I don't have it up right now. Valerie, do you recall? Um, um, yeah, or, yeah um, it's about the... Uh, the Hi, I'm sorry, uh, this is Hannah. Um, the equity ratio is about the equity ratio and in the mini it says it's the stakeholder equity ratio. So I just say cross out the stakeholder. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas. Okay. Given the way we all responded clearly, Douglas, we all we all saw it and are eager to address it. <laughs> right. Okay. So then, um, I, let's see. As we're going through this, so if we don't have any more changes, then the minutes will stand as they are. Okay. So the DCDCA state um, updates. Um, that's item number four, and. Let's start with this one, and we've got the, um, I'll ask, uh, this is any comments on um, item 4A, I want to recognize Graham Bradner, who was confirmed unanimously at our last DCA board meeting last week as the official DCA executive director, so he is not interim anymore, he is the executive director, so congratulations, Graham, we're very glad that you are, that you are working with us on this. Um, so item 4A, anything? else on this one. I'll ask Graham and the DCA Council, Josh Nelson, please provide the DCA update. Uh, will do. Thank you, Chair Palmer. Um, and I appreciate the congratulations. <clears throat> so a couple of updates here. So at our last uh, June DCA Board of Directors meeting, uh, there was a discussion and decision to adjust the meeting cadence for the DCA Board of Directors. The plan going forward is going to be to start uh, starting in July. So we'll have our next meeting in July and then we'll shift to bi-monthly after that. Uh, we will still continue to prepare monthly board reports and keep summarizing progress uh, as we have been. But in terms of the meeting, meeting cadence, we'll be shifting to bi-monthly. Um, <clears throat> this seems to be a good time and place for that, given where we are in the program and activities within the DCA. Seems like an appropriate shift. Uh, certainly, if at any point there's a desire to, to change the cadence again, that's, that's absolutely something that can be discussed and decided by the board. And I would expect next year, probably around um, early, mid-spring, we'll probably start meeting a little more frequently as we're discussing some of the same annual, annual types of discussions that we went through over the past year. But um, that, that's the, uh, I think, one of the items that I wanted to bring up here to let this group know the meeting, meeting cadence for the board is, is going to adjust after July. 
the next item I wanted to bring also coming from the, this is from the DCA board meeting in May. Uh, we had a, a discussion and this is regarding the SEC, uh, the, the attendance and, and size of the SEC. Uh, we, we approved, the board approved an adjustment to, to right size the, the SEC from a 20 member body to a 17 member body. We had three vacancies. Uh, we, we still would have three vacancies at the time. And in fact, in April at the last SEC meeting in April, we almost didn't have quorum. We, need, we would need for a 20 member body, 11 uh, members of the SEC to attend, excluding the ex officio members. And we were at 11 at the time of roll call. And so it got a little dicey. We weren't sure we were gonna be able to maintain quorum through that meeting. It would be very, um, very disruptive to, to lose quorum. We would have to shut the meeting down uh, in that moment because of the Brown Act requirements. And so nobody wants that to happen. In order to, to keep, keep the SEC sustainable and functional, it seemed like the, the right decision to just eliminate the vacant seats. We can certainly at any point add additional seats back in uh, that's been done in the past. And then I'll also note that we have five ex officio seats and currently only three are taken. So there's even two, two vacant ex officio seats that are still available. So uh, by no means is this intended to, to um, weaken the SEC. It's actually intended to strengthen it, ensuring that we can continue to have quorum and have our meetings uh, go forward as intended and not be disrupted because of, of an attendance issue. Um, <clears throat> so those are the two, two items that I wanted to update the group on, group on uh, Chair Palmer. And I think Josh is now gonna address a few items too. Okay, could I just in interrupt on that one right there because this, uh, I think Barbara, um, Barbara Keegan has got some point she wanted to make. I don't wanna put you on the spot, Barbara, but uh, there was some worry that we didn't have somebody who was representing the boating and the recreation. And um, one of the things that we would like to put out there is that we would really appreciate somebody coming in on that one as ex officio. So Barbara, did you wanna say something about that? Um, I would, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Great. Um, yeah, I think the thing is that, uh, you know, recreational boating is such an important part of the, the Delta community in terms of people who either live in the Delta or visit. Um, and those folks that visit, you know, spend money at marinas and businesses and things like that. So I think we have lost that perspective. And I think I would really appreciate getting um, input into whether or not the group thinks that that perspective is an important one. And perhaps we could have like an ex officio member or someone of that nature. So it would really be representing not just the recreational boaters, but um, the business community within the Delta. Okay, and thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, um, because we, we do want to make sure that even if we don't have a, a member who officially represents who represents that as a as an SEC member, an ex officio member, somebody who has a voice in that re, in that area would be most welcome. So thank you very much. So let's go on continue, Josh. I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thanks, Chair Palmer. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to provide provide a brief update about the uh, status of the executive order, which allows us to meet remotely. Um, uh, SEC members, you may have seen. Um, as part of the uh, June 15th reopening, the governor issued an executive order, um, which uh, uh, continued the current um, Brown Act suspension, which allow us to meet completely remotely um, through September 30th. Um, so I know we have a meeting um, scheduled for September 22nd, so that um, will we'll remain completely remotely, uh, remote, excuse me. But begin, beginning October 1st, um, absent further um, clarification from the governor, um, we will be under the um, old rules or the, the traditional rules of the Brown Act, um, which do permit um, teleconference attendance by um, uh, members of the committee at meetings, um, but requires that uh, those locations where a member is um, participating remotely be listed on the agenda, open to the public and have the agenda um, uh, a list at that location. I think given those constraints, staff's looking at moving back to in-person meetings um, beginning in October, um, but we are still uh, reviewing all options and more information will um, be forthcoming. We just wanted to make sure the committee was aware of that um, and had an opportunity to ask any questions you might have. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so now we're going to go on to item 4B, uh, which is uh, DWR's environmental program manager, Carrie Buckman. 
will provide an update on the C-Corp process. So take it away, Carrie. Thank you, Chair Palmer. So I just have a couple of slides to talk about a quick update on where we are on the environmental process. So I think uh, everyone on this committee is at this point probably more familiar with this figure than they might like. Uh, so this is the, the general process that we're going through to try to move towards an environmental impact report. So similar to, I think the last time we talked about it, right now we are working on technical reports and assessing impacts. So we're producing a series of technical analyses to try to help understand the alternatives better and we're using those as the basis to analyze impacts. And if we find potentially significant impacts, then we will assess the potential for mitigation. So we're sort of in the middle of that right now. And when this is done, it will be combined into internal drafts and then a public draft EIR, which is still scheduled for release in mid 2022. From there, we will have public, uh, <laughs> it's okay, we can go on. <laughs> there will be public review after the public draft. Uh, next slide. So just an overview of a, a series of things that we're working on. As I mentioned for CEQA or the California Environmental Quality Act, we're working on the technical studies and impact analysis to work towards compiling a draft EIR. Uh, for NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act, the Corps of Engineers is leading the NEPA process. They are following a similar process to develop an environmental impact statement and they are also planning to release that document in mid 2022 so that the review period will overlap with ours. Um, there, also, there also is work proceeding for soil investigations. We completed an initial study in mitigated negative declaration last year, and there was work in 2020. There was a break for, for the wet season. And then this year in 2021, work started again in March. And at this point, we're expecting a short break in July, but I did want to highlight that if people are wondering what's coming up, uh, the information is always on our website. We have a map with a two-week look ahead that we post on our website and we keep that up to date. And then the other updates that really are part of the environmental planning we're going to cover later in the meeting. So we'll talk a little bit about the EJ survey report, the community benefits program development, and the technical workshop that we have planned for the next few months. So those will be later in the agenda. Janet's gonna talk about those. So I guess Chair Palmer, any questions now? Or are we holding those? If anybody has any, any questions? Anything from the SEC? Yes, yeah. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, Carrie, just um, in a short form, what's the difference between what CEQA is and what the core does? Like, are you looking at different things or how do these two reports or sets of work differ? So I'm tempted to give a really wonky answer and I'm trying to, to temper my instincts. Uh, I say generally the types of things that are studied are, are generally similar. I think the biggest difference that a reader will notice is that the core has guidance that they keep their environmental documents to less than 300 pages. So the main body of their EIS will be shorter. Uh, that means that a lot of information is sort of incorporated by reference either from our EIR or from appendices because this is a very large project to try to analyze the environmental impacts in 300 pages. But the main body will be shorter and that I think will be the most notable difference. There are some other differences. Uh, NEPA includes analysis of some resources that CEQA doesn't include, uh, such as environmental justice impacts and socioeconomics. But we are including those in our EIR to sort of provide information towards developing the NEPA document and because we uh, think it's information that is um, some, somewhat useful. So we'll have those in our EIR as well. Typically, they're not included in EIRs. And one is a state document and one is a federal document? Yep. CEQA is a state requirement. So any state <coughs> agency that has to take an action, so either implement a project or approve a permit or provide funding, needs to complete CEQA. And then the and same is true on NEPA. NEPA is the federal equivalent. So it's a little different, but similar objectives. Do you work together and share information? Sort of. So um, because the core is a regulatory agency, you know, they're not a project partner, they're a regulatory agency. So they view their role a little differently. So they're, uh, you know, they really want to maintain that impartiality that they're, they're regulating this. 
So they're, they're proceeding to develop their EIS a little bit separately from us, but we are sharing the information that we have as we develop it so that they can use that as part of the EIS as they choose to. Thank okay. you. Thank you, David. Very good questions. Um, anyone else? Um, I, I'm sorry, Barbara here. I can't find the raised hand function for some reason today. I'm going to all the usual places and it's not appearing. I apologize. You go down to the bottom where it says participants. Can you see participants? Yeah, I'm not. I have invite and alt one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. If you go to the three dots at the bottom of participants, you should have the raise hand function. It's funny, I'm not getting that today, so I, I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll write raise okay. hand in the chat. No worries. No worries. <laughs> okay. Your hand works. Just wait um, vigorously and hopefully we'll see you. <laughs> okay. I apologize. I had a uh, little bit of a commotion um, here at uh, World Headquarters. Do we... When it, what administrative draft is coming out the, in the next couple of weeks? So we aren't releasing any internal draft. So those are for our internal review. We are working to try to get to an internal draft. But again, that's something where the consulting team is developing a draft for us to review. We don't entirely know what's in it yet. So it's definitely something that I would, I would frame as an internal draft where we know there will be many things that need review and revision. Uh, so we're not, not planning to, unlike WaterFix, I know that WaterFix released administrative drafts for yeah. public review. We aren't planning to do that. And the reason is that there was a lot of frustration in the past that the comments that were provided, you know, the, the document was released and it was framed that this is for information, comments that are provided will not be incorporated. But that was a pretty frustrating thing to tell people, you know, here's a document, you can look at it if you want to, but we're not going to do anything with your comments. So rather than having that kind of frustrating message and process, we're going to release the public draft um, instead when it's ready for review and we'll be able to address the comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Nothing, Valerie? Nope. Okay. Uh, then nope, no hands up. Oh, wait, Anna just put her hand up. Hi, Anna. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. So um, what is the um, timeline for the public to comment on that document? So when like we many... release, yeah, so when we release the draft EIR, we're planning on a three month public comment period. I believe the regulation is 45 days and, and we recognize that we need to provide more time. So we're planning on three months. The core has their own process and I believe they're planning on a shorter review period, but I don't know their time. Uh, what we're planning to do is make sure that the review periods overlap, but ours will probably uh, extend for longer, perhaps on both sides of their process. So uh, the other question I have is about like availability. So as you know, we have like a broadband issue here in the Delta. So one of the solutions to that was to provide copies of um, those type of documents on either flash drives or CDs and then have those available at the library. So do you think that we could um, ask, you know, make that ask to make this more available to people who don't necessarily have the broadband to try to upload it? We will absolutely have comment or copies available at the library. We should also, as we get closer to that, think about where else might be useful, uh, you know, okay. like perhaps, um, yeah, like we're, we're happy to, to spread out copies as well as mail CDs or flash drives or whatever is easiest for folks. We, we're happy to distribute in whatever way works. Okay, thank you very much. And Carrie, again, that's next year, correct? Next year, okay. 2022. And so a lot of the, the, the dynamics related to accessibility and everything are being looked at for uh, that distribution process, correct? Yeah, and I think, you know, what we've seen in the last year is that some of our opportunities have been somewhat limited because of COVID and we are expecting that that will open up in a way that should make libraries more accessible to people. So we'll have some time to, to work that out. But certainly if there are suggestions on up for places to put copies, let us know. Okay. Yeah, because our broadband issue, I don't think is going to disappear yeah. with COVID, unfortunately. Yep. Good point, Santa. Good point. Thank you. Okay, so anyone else from, from the SEC? We'll do public comment after, after item four altogether. Okay, so let's go on to item 4C, 
Uh, Ms. Martinez, can you lead us through the SEC questions or comments from the April meeting? Yes, um, if in fact anyone has uh, a need for clarification or any questions related to the discussion items from April, please uh, raise your hand. Again, some of the items that were discussed were some of design adjustments, particularly to the uh, Bethany Reservoir and the Bethany Discharge Structure. Um, again, out, out, I'm sorry, ongoing outreach efforts um, were part of the discussion and that will continue to be part of the discussion today as well. Um, there was a presentation on the environmental justice survey results uh, and also um, a, a discussion regarding community benefits program. So uh, if anyone has questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand or again, any clarifications? Um, or Barbara, just wave really vigorously and we'll see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Barbara. Nope, Barbara Bergen. Nope, she's not on. Okay. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute fast enough. No, we're good. Okay, okay good, good. We're, we're, we're taking everyone's calls. All right. Well, and again, the minutes were also very, very comprehensive. So if, in fact, you want to refresh your memory at a later date, that's always an option. All right. And Cece just put her hand up. Cece? I wanted to ask, I, I couldn't figure out how to uh, access the survey results. I got the email that they were there, but I wasn't able to go into them and read them. Is uh, Janet on? I am on. Um, maybe what I can do is provide the link, Jasmine, if you wanted to send that out or put it in the chat or I don't know what's allowable, but um, I can provide the link. Yeah, I can also email all the CC after if you want to put it in the chat. Okay. But I, yeah, sure. That's terrific. Thanks so much, Janet. Thanks for the question. Uh, CC, I think that's it. Does it include the, uh, all of the input of the, from the survey? Oh, I think it's a report. Janet, if you want to clarify. It, yeah, uh, sure. Happy to. Yeah, it is a summary report, um, oh, but we do. I yeah, think, so I, I thought it would include the actual survey results. I did read that summary. Okay. Yeah, and it does have all of the survey results for all of the questions, um, but there will be at some future point, um, we are working on, um, you know, the, the, the survey itself, we wanted to make sure that it was um, confidential. And so we're currently scrubbing all of the data to make sure that all of that remains uh, confidential, but we will um, at some point in the future, it's a pretty heavy lift, but we will be able to make that um, public. I'm curious why it's confidential. Because that's how surveys are designed. Um, we, we go into it telling people that um, if they, you know, to, this, a lot of times people don't want to participate in a survey if they feel like their information, their personal information is going to be used somehow. So we just make it clear that it's, it's confidential. I understand that. I'm, I'm looking for their statements, not their names. Right, exactly. So we just want to make sure that we protect all of the, um, all of the people that. that participated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. I think that's it. Barbara actually has a question she, she commented in the chat. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, here we go. <laughs> go ahead, Barbara. Uh, and so it is a question for, um, it is a question for Janet. The, I understand the scrubbing. Um, are you going to be able to drill down for us, I think, better than what we saw there on location of participants? Um, maybe, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe census tract, something that maybe matches up a little bit more with Kel and Viro screen, or even some of the indicators used by the DSC in the climate vulnerability assessment. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm not, I'm not personally sure exactly what will be available. I just know that our main consideration is the confidentiality aspect. And so what comes out of that will be everything that we can provide that we collected that doesn't um, betray the confidentiality promise. Okay, yeah, I know it's hard because you're doing a survey versus looking just at statistical data. But I don't know, maybe there's a potential for some type of map if you could even just overlay in a 
broader geographical area compared to Cal Enviro screen? Because I think that the, I think that's I think it's important to see how it matches up with identified EJ communities. That that's that's the key. So maybe there's a creative way where you do that where you don't plunk in the sense the census track, but you could kind of geographically give an outlay. Yeah, I think like last last meeting we had, Barbara, I think you were bringing up the idea of either with like uh, like either zip codes or or knowing if, if people were urban or rural. Or yeah, yeah. And so I, I'm just bringing it up again because I think that's re it's really important data to understand because <clears throat> what you did was a survey, and there is a you know we're working on this project with the DSC right now. And there is a difference between a survey and a deep ethnographic study. Mm -hmm. And so I really want to see, and versus the statistical data you get with Cal EPA. And I think that all of us, no matter what we're working on or what we agree on or don't agree on, I think we want to line that up and really understand the data so that we know we're getting really to the right people. That's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I think we're, uh, I, don't, I don't see anyone's hand up or any comments in chat. Okay, so are we, are we done with 4C there, Valerie? Yes, we are. Okay, then we're going to move on to 4D because that's where we're going to take public comment um, on all the things from item number four. So do we have any members of the public who are wishing to um, to add comment here. Um, I, I don't see anyone's, uh, or we have no cards that have been submitted, no emails that have been submitted. I wanna note that it is 3.30 because I wanna do a little time check for the SCC. Um, so I think we can move on. Okay, great. So now we're gonna move on to the presentations and committee discussions and the technical items. So with item 4A, with design change, um, design change update, I'd like to ask Graham and Phil Ryan, please, to provide an update on the design changes. Thank you, Chair Palmer. We're going to review <clears throat> three design changes, the first being down at the connection to the South Delta facilities. Then we've been working with and realigning the ring levy configuration at Twin Cities. And then lastly, we'll show the brick changes down at the Southern Four Bay. Uh, the first one, Phil Ryan, is going to review on the South Delta connection. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a not quite as much of a design change as sort of an update on something we haven't spent a lot of time with the SEC on. Um, this particular spot you see here is a facility that's only involved in the Central and East corridors if the uh, federal government participates in the project. So it's in our 7500 CFS alternatives. So in that case, there'd be a connection from our uh, South Delta facilities over to the Delta Mendota Canal, which you can see down there in the dash box in the lower right. So the main facilities here are a control structure that we would add on to the um, South Delta outlet and control structure. And then um, you can see the little black line there, the 20 foot diameter tunnel, an outlet structure on the DMC and a uh, control structure in the DMC. There's also this facility for um, the Bethany alternative too. Uh, it's very similar, except it obviously connects from the other side of the canal. So why don't you go to the next one as a little bit of a close up and we can. So one of the reasons this came up is, you know, we do project updates and we did update this facility recently to give it the same level of flood resiliency that the rest of the project had. The, the Delta Mendota Canal is a little bit lower than the rest of the state project. And in the end, we realized that we hadn't incorporated the full 200-year um, plus sea level rise flood control at this particular facility. So in the event of that type of a flooding event, the, if the um, Central Valley Project were participating, they'd, they'd be able to use this facility where their own facilities might be drowned out. So, um, you know, the, the drivers for this facility, the layout is we do have to maintain the flow in this canal while we build all this stuff. So you can see those two 
cellular propagands, little circles on the sort of top and bottom of the structures there. We would put a, a sheet pile channel around those um, from the upper one to the lower one and then dry out the channel in between so that we could uh, build the structures. So that kind of drives how we want everything as compact as possible. And then you can see that there's um, uh, spoils piles. If you've been out there, you know that it's like the um, California aqueduct. There's giant um, spoils piles on the sides of the canals from when they dug them originally. So that material, it's, it's quite tall and it's quite a lot, it's quite wide. So we would have to move that um, out of our project area and we set it up so that whatever you dig up on one side, we stockpile on one side and uh, each side. So you can see that the uh, west side is a pretty small stockpile because we don't have nearly the uh, amount of excavation on that side, mainly because the bypass is on the other side. And so there's quite a large stockpile um, to the, uh, on the right side there um, for the excess material there. Um, one of the reasons that stockpiled here is this is a very difficult place to get uh, trucking over to the southern four bay and this reduces the overall impacts of the project. So with that, I'm going to go back to Graham and he's going to take the next two updates. Great. Thank you, Phil. So this next item, this is uh, regarding realignment of the ring levy, the ring levy at Twin Cities Complex. So the original configuration shown on the screen here, we've, we've got in the upper left-hand corner, the central and eastern configuration, and then down in the lower right-hand corner, the Bethany Reservoir alternative configuration. So these were originally designed to fully surround the construction work area and provide passive protection, um, or in, intended to provide passive protection for a 100-year flood event, if it were to flood the inside of Planville Track as it, as it has done in the past, as flood events have done in the past. The, uh, the passive configuration required a tie-in to the Deerson Road ramp, and so that's most obvious on the upper image there. You see that little, that little extension there, yeah, that extends over and ties in. That's an earth ramp to, to ramp Deerson Road up and over I-5, and so the ring levy would have tied into that earthen ramp to create the full perimeter uh, ring levy protection. And so, the, and then the site is configured with a north area and a south area, and they, they sort of duplicate one another. And, and that was intended to provide space for two separate potential tunnel contractors. If there was a, a contractor doing the north tunnel and a contractor doing the south tunnel, they would have these separate work areas to, to uh, execute their work. So now if we could go to the next slide, please. So we've reconfigured both the, the central and eastern configurations and the Bethany Reservoir configurations to remove that tie-in to the Deerson Road ramp. And instead, we're, we pulled things back from I-5 a bit and created more space there. The reason being, we, we, we had to shift the west side of the ring levy to provide more space for shallow overland flow as it, as it tends to, if it does occur, how it behaves in this area. And the topography is generally sloping from north to south and has historically flowed overland over the low parts of Deerson Road there. And so what we've done with this reconfiguration is provide room for that shallow overland flow to follow that topography, fly an up, uh, flow up and over the low section of Deerson Road there, and then also at the same time have better access to the existing culverts underneath I-5. Um, so the, the, that's the point of these reconfigurations is to allow more space for that movement of water and more access to those culverts. You can see over on the Bethany side, it, it took a bit more work to, to create that space and, and make that work, but we've, we've got it reconfigured. We did have to ship some of the contractor materials and consolidate some items on the south side of Deerson Road there, just because there, there isn't quite enough room on the north side. But uh, we've got everything fit in the space and have provided the, the room that I just described there between the, the West Levy and I. Next slide, please. So then the next change that we'll review here is the, the southern four bay footprint. <clears throat> and so this is the original footprint that we've been working with until recently. It included a couple of different stockpile areas. First, there was a, a temporary topsoil storage area. That's that sort of triangular shaped uh, area that's just inside the yellow lines in the northeast corner 
over by Italian School and Old River. So that was intended to just be temporary stockpiling of stripped topsoil material. Then we had a, a permanent peat stockpile area really tucked in between Italian Slough and the Southern Four Bay. So in the space there would, would be where any peat that was excavated from the foundation of the embankment would be stock, stockpiled permanently and then covered to, to limit oxidation. And then we had an area on the north side that you can see the large rectangular area, which was RT, is identified as RTM material and, and permanent top, topsoil stockpile. So all of this combined create, creates quite a bit of different stockpile areas and footprint effects. And so now that we've really got a better handle on the soil balance at the site and the, the different flow alternatives and how they, they affect the, the various quantities, we've been able to go back and, and uh, revise the footprint here and tighten up the stockpile requirements. So next slide, please. So that in, in clicking, we probably saw a couple of things disappear. So the, the peat stockpile there is, is no longer at that location between the Southern Four Bay and Italian Slough. The temporary topsoil location is no longer there on the Northeast side. What we've been able to work out is that the, the Northern area is sufficiently sized to uh, contain all the materials we're talking about here, permanent peat stockpile, temporary topsoil, permanent cover, as well as any leftover RTM material that's unused at the site. Uh, so if you click maybe back and forth one more time, folks can get a little bit better sense of the, the site reductions there. And so in, in doing that, I mean, just looking at the, the 6,000 CFS project alternative, it does reduce the temporary footprint on the order of about 250 acres roughly, and then the permanent footprint on the order of about 150 acres. So th those are the design changes that we're going to review today. And uh, I think at this point, we pause for questions from the SEC. OK, we have one hand up at this point. Uh, SEC member Gwoski. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I apologize for not making the last meeting where maybe some of these things were covered. But um, in this diagram here, does it mean that during the project, you're actually using the area of the four bay to do treatment of this RTM and stuff, and then later on it becomes a four bay? That's correct. So the RTM will be generated from, <clears throat> would be generated from two different tunnel drives, the, the north drive out of the pumping plant area, and then that shifts over to the, the shaft in the upper right hand corner. And then there's the south delta outlet tunnel drives that leave from the southern end of the, southern end of the four bay heading south. So we actually have two areas to just spread and dry that material and then stockpile it for on-site reuse. Great. And my, my second question is clearly you're doing a lot of looking at this southern four bay area. And the last discussion was about the different pumps, the two different pump sets that were in there and tying to the, the federal project. And I'm just wondering whether you folks had any internal discussions or thoughts about things that I've been raising for a number of months in the ability for this project to deliver fresh water to the South Delta in emergency and other scenarios, and that the two sets of pumps, uh, if they're in, they're completely redundant going up to Bethany. Um, so, I guess I don't have a, an answer for you, David. I think, um, um, I guess I would ask whether, uh, I guess maybe Carrie, is this something that, that you want to chime in on? So I think that the, the pump redundancy thing is at Bethany, we've talked about a number of times and I don't think that any answers there have changed. So just to, to sort of answer for the committee, um, we've talked about the idea that if, the Bethany pump station was connected either to Clifton Court Four Bay or to Banks, that that might provide additional redundancy in the system. But from, from our perspective, when we're looking at that, uh, those connections have the potential to increase the potential environmental effects. Uh, and they would be in areas that do have some sensitive species. So we were concerned about that. And additionally, we think that we already have a pretty good amount of redundancy because we're looking at a dual system where we can use either Clifton Court, Four Bay and Banks or Bethany. So we did not carry that forward into the alternative. Uh, in terms of the, the possibility of having the water from the Southern Four Bay able to go into the, the Delta 
under emergency conditions. That's something that we're still talking about. I, I don't think that we've sort of fully fleshed that out. I think that, you know, we've had some discussions with the folks that do that type of management and they do recognize that sort of every potential knob that is available during an emergency would be considered, but we haven't really worked out the plumbing aspect of that if it would be included. I mean, you already have the basics of it. If you have an overflow mm -hmm. from the Southern Four Bay into Indian Slough, you, I mean, you just have to analyze. But the water has to get there. Right, and you're, yeah. I guess you're pumping in there. So regarding the redundancy, you know, I'll continue to bring it up because I, I can't imagine. I, I did hear in all the nice discussions you folks set me up with that, you know, uh, the existing pump system is pretty long in the tooth and there's maintenance issues and such. And so I, I just can't imagine that you wouldn't have the two things be redundant. So I'll just leave it as that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, SEC member. Um, we have several hands up at this point. SEC member uh, Swenson. Um, yeah, so I would like to address the ring levy and this configuration that you have down at Twin Cities. I'm actually horrified that you want to put a ring levy in an area that's already experiences issues with high water events. And when the railroad um, raised the rail line to um, prevent damage from floods, it impacted all of the landowners in that area negatively. And so now yet another agency is coming in and going to put a ring levy, which is potentially going to cause total havoc in this area during now not even, you know, extreme high water events, but, but potentially, you know, mild to moderate high water events, because yet again, another raised barrier that's going to push water and I realize that you're trying to like access the culverts on I-5 but there's there's a already a flood issue in that area that that if you talk to the landowners out there they will talk about knee-high waist-high water and these people have lived out there their entire lives and their families have lived out there generations and so now you're putting a ring barrier a ring levy another barrier in, in an area that's already flood prone. So there are lots of red flags when I look at that, that, um, that idea. I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think you've taken into consideration the extreme threat of severe flooding and people losing homes and people being um, put in danger because of a, a, an additional ring levy in that area. And I, and you know, this, I'm raising the alarm. This is, this is, this is not correct to do that to this community because they already have that problem. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Um, so, go so ahead. Valerie, if I could. Um, Please. So, so Anna, um, I, I appreciate the concern and, you know, we're, we're absolutely aware of the historical flooding that's occurred in, in the area. And um, when we performed our flood risk mitigation review for all the sites, uh, we, we looked very hard at this site and have landed on a ring levy. It's, it's a temporary facility to protect the construction operations as really the only alternative. I, I agree with you that the railroad embankment along the eastern side of Glamour Track um, it, it is an issue. It, I know it does provide flood protection, but it's also a railroad embankment. And um, it's very, very unlikely that any sort of improvements along that, that stretch of railroad could be worked out with, with UPRR. The ring levy does uh, provide protection for the construction site. And we have been looking in a very detailed fashion. There's an existing hydraulic model uh, called the North Delta model, which I'm sure a lot of the hydraulic modelers and engineers uh, and flood engineers of the area are familiar with. We've been able to include the, the ring levy configuration and use that as a very helpful tool to, uh, to ensure that the, the ring levy itself is, is not going to have substantial impacts on the existing flood conditions that occur within there. It is very shallow overland flooding, but it is very broad. And uh, if there's interest in, in that, that's in progress work, but I think we'd be happy to to bring some of those back at the next SEC meeting and share what we're seeing. And I think that you just um, really keyed in on the on the on one of the biggest problems with that with this 
blood area is that um, a lot of people see that embankment as an improvement, but there are a lot of people who are negatively impacted by it. And because it's the railroad, they, they, they were railroaded. They just ended up with those impacts. And so um, I think that, that a ring levy in an area that already has historical flooding the way it does is not in the best interest of public safety. And I don't think it's in the best interest of the people. I mean, we're already bearing this huge impact. Like we're taking all of the burden of this project, right? And now you're saying, well, we're gonna build this permanent facility and it's gonna be, you know, I, I understand how it works out there. Anything that's new has to get raised. Well, every time you raise something in an area where it's flooding, you are negatively impacting somebody else because they're gonna have deeper water. And so it is crazy to me that the state of California or DWR or, or DCA would intentionally, with knowledge, know that they're gonna put, increase the flood risk and, and increase the, the height of the flood for these people. They count on the flood going up to a certain level and not invading their homes. If we increase and put a put a, a pressure someplace else, now homes could start being flooded even though they haven't historically done that. And that would then lay on your responsibility because you you put this huge area of land, you've elevated it and put a ring levy. So I I wholeheartedly urge you to find someplace else other than that floodplain. Thank you. So I think it's important to say, and I, I said this already, that we're using uh, the best available technology and engineering to make sure that this ring levy is not affecting uh, the surrounding flood levels and affecting surrounding properties. So I have to, to push back on your comment because I, I said that and then uh, that, that didn't seem to, to register. But because that's that what the we, railroad told them. I think we, the railroad told them the same thing and now they're having negative impacts. So although were, best of intentions at this moment, you're leaving a legacy of something that really in, impacts people in a way to be flooded out is terrible and we would never want to do that intentionally. And so I know your intentions are very good, but historic the, the historic pattern has been, oh, this is going to be okay. And then it's not. So Maybe we need more reassurances. I don't know. Thank you. Okay. So Graham, do you want to complete your thought, please? Um, I think it's something that we would be happy to come back and share with. Uh, it's, again, it's work that we're, we're really focusing on right now. And so I think if there's interest and it sounds like there is, we'd be happy to come back and, and share that at the next session. Sure, that might be something that we put on the next agenda uh, or, or perhaps the agenda after that, depending on when it's ready. Yep. Sounds great. Okay, uh, SEC member Shia. Okay, yeah, I'd like to uh, mention about the ring, the ring levy too. Well, I think uh, I understand that uh, your intention is to protect the operation, um, but um, I just want to remind you that the most of the levy around the area is less than 100 year flood protection. Well, and uh, I think, um, uh, I hope that uh, in the future, you can pay more attention to bring up the level of protection of the levy in the region and uh, not just protecting your operation. That's all. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Uh, SEC member Lytle. Good afternoon. I'd like to also uh, concur with Anna's comments regarding the uh, levy improvements around the operations area there along Twin Cities Road. As someone that lived on Twin Cities Road back during the flood of 1986, I very much understand the impact of the railroad tracks even back in 1986. They were a huge impediment to the water flow in that area and caused significant flooding under over a wide area of uh, that. And so uh, I think that we, I would be uh, very, very interested to understand how you've modeled the potential flood impact with this new uh, ring levied area, hundreds of acres of ring levied area, essentially that's a log jam right down in an area that you don't want that to be. 
when that consumers river is flooding in that watershed. And so I would be very interested to see uh, your modeling as far as potential flood impact, not only to the neighboring uh, ranches and farms in that area, but uh, the potential impact as it moves up towards Elk Grove. Um, uh, second, second statement and question is, is how did you come to the uh, analysis and understanding that a hundred year uh, level of protection around that would be sufficient? Um, my question comes particularly that you're gonna have a dry storage area of RTM, very large area up to what, 15 to 25 feet high. Um, a 100 year event may occur, but potentially something greater than that. And so, and which would expose that entire area to the RTM being dispersed and throughout uh, the watershed and lands in and around that. And so I think that um, the, the analysis of a 100 year event, 100 year levee protection may be insufficient to protect the contaminated spoils that might be there. And so those are significant things I think you need to kind of rethink a little bit. Thank you, Mel. Uh, just, Graham, before you answer, I just want to do a time check. It was 3.56. And as a reminder, if anyone wants to provide public comment, you need to get your information in now. Please email by 4 o'clock. Thank you. Um, our Executive Director, Graham. Thank you. Um, so there, uh, thank you, Dr. Lytle. I think there were a few different points in there and I'll try and work through them. But I guess maybe working backwards, um, first of all, I think we, we have come with, with a lot of information and data on the RTM and its properties. And so at this point, I, you know, I, I have to, I guess, say that I, nothing that we're seeing in the information indicates that it's toxic or hazardous material. It appears to be soil. And I know we've, we've had this discussion many, many times, and I'm sure there's still many opinions about it, but I feel like I need to, to just go ahead and say that. And there's several SEC meetings with lots of laboratory data to back that up. Um, but in terms of, of how we've established the, the flood levels and the analysis levels, uh, remember that the, the ring levee itself, itself is a temporary structure. It will be there for the, for the life of the construction project, and then it will be degraded and added to the permanent stockpile of material there. There, there would be, um, in, you know, one thing to also make note of with the analysis we performed, we did not include the McCormick Williamson Track project, which is gonna lower the flood levels in the Consumers River Channel by a good foot or so and, and reduce the flood risks for the inside Glanville Track. We have not included that project as an existing condition in our analysis. So I think that's an extra layer of conservatism that we've been accounted for. Um, in terms of the flooding characteristics in that area, it's actually a higher area. If you look at the topography, as you move over closer to that railroad embankment, it's you're climbing in elevation, you're, you're climbing up, up and above 10 feet or so. So you're actually getting up to points within the Glanville Tract that have historically been dry during some of the past flood events, even as it flooded parts of the area deeper around I-5 and adjacent to I-5 as you move very close over to Franklin Boulevard. There are uh, sections there where it's quite a bit higher in elevation. That's where the, the permanent stockpile potentially would be located. So you end up with a very, very thin uh, height of water that could potentially be affected by, by the permanent placement of material. That material would be seeded and covered in vegetation to limit its ability to be eroded and washed around, which would be you know, seeded grass and, and everything to permanently stabilize it. So there's, I think, several different points related to the, to the comments and questions we have there. Um, but again, I, I think it would be good to, to go through this in a little more detail at a later date once we have that information. But uh, that's the type of thinking that went into the reconfigurations and the shapes. And we've analyzed not only the ring levy configuration, but also the effects of the permanent stockpile on, on uh, potential future flooding conditions. But again, not even including the Cormac Williamson track project. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, SEC member Moran. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Graham and Phil. This is a very interesting discussion. Uh, can we go back to the overview of the South Delta connection, the first slide in this that Phil was introducing? And I'm just curious, perhaps I missed that, and if I did, I apologize. 
But what would the Bethany alternative look like with a tie-in to the federal, to the Central Valley project? Did we already discuss that? Well, I mentioned it, Mike, but I didn't show a, a slide for it. So basically, you see the structure that looks like a bow tie and the canal there? I do. That would be identical. Okay. And where the stockpile is, is essentially where the Bethany pumping plant and surge basin is. Um, so they would have a pipeline coming off the pumps that would be about where the lower yellow line is. And it would come over and feed into a structure on the opposite side from where we show the tunnel outlet structure. So the facility is, you know, remarkably similar but not exactly the same. Okay, so essentially they have a tie-in to the tunnel with whatever required hardware there would be. Yeah, and it would require pumps um, at, at this particular facility because the water level in the DMC is pretty low, but the ground level over at the um, pump station is close to elevation 50. So we have to get it up into a pipeline with the pumps mm -hmm. and then let it, and then a lot of times the depending on the flow rate in the tunnel, the water level could be quite low in the tunnel. So where it flows essentially by gravity on the, after it's lifted into the forebay on central and east options, in the Bethany option, it's always pumped. It's always pumped. Could you use your cursor, Phil, and just give us an idea where the Bethany um, alternative would go, where that tunnel and pipe system would go? Well, I don't actually have cursor yep. control. Phil, <laughs> oh, <that's okay. laughs> Phil if you want to, if you want to talk me through it, I could use my cursor. So, just, so you see just... where the the stockpile is there. That okay. Yeah. So, if you imagine that's a little bit more centered in that parcel, that mm -hmm. would be where the pumping plant is. So okay. coming off the upper left hand corner, Jasmine, that yellow line, that's where the pipeline would go, yep. and then right on the end at the edge of the canal would. No, on the end of the yellow line. If you if you continue, no, not that way. <laughs> it's just the, the first piece coming off. Continue it all the way over to the canal. Take your cursor, follow the yellow line. I, keep, now keep going. Oh yeah, yeah there you yeah, go. Yeah, right there. Yeah, there you yeah. <laughs> So right there, where a cursor is, there would be an outlet structure, and so the pump flow would come out from the pumping plant, flow through the pipeline over there, and discharge into structure into the canal. Okay, so from Bethany, from the Bethany alternative tunnel or pipeline, whatever it is, how long, how far would it be over to the Delta Mendota Canal structure? Well, not very far. It's, uh, I want to say it's less than half a mile. Okay. I, I, I could look it up. But no, that's okay. That ballpark's great. That's great. Okay. And would that be on the surface or would that be underground? It would be a buried 15 foot diameter pipeline. Okay, great. With a big pipe, right. but yeah. it would be buried. Okay, very good. Thank you. So just to, to jump in so there isn't too much confusion, I did want to mention that the EIR is not currently including an alternative where Bethany is connected to the to that approach channel, because right now we're only looking at Bethany at 6,000 CFS and connecting to banks. There is no connection to Jones. So yeah. this is sort of for informational purposes, but it won't it won't be in the EIR. Yeah, that's a good point. When we originally developed the Bethany alternative, we developed it for all the capacities. So that's why there's a, a, an analysis for it at, on Bethany. That's why we have one. Thank you for the clarification. Terry, is that because, um, because the feds haven't yet committed? Right, so the feds haven't committed. So the idea is, you know, we have a proposed project at 6,000 CFS. And so our alternatives are all sort of comparing back to that proposed project. So, you know, we looked at capacities higher with the feds and lower, and then we're looking at the Bethany alternative, but it's, it's sort of based on that comparison. So because we're varying the alternative and the alignment, we're not also varying the capacities. We're just looking at 6,000 to understand how that different alignment would change the effects of the proposed project. Now, if the feds decide to, to come in, is that going to put a, um, a wrench into the works at all in terms of the ADIR? If that were to happen, there would need to be some additional evaluation if the Bethany alternative was chosen. But I, I mean, we have no basis for that at the moment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, SEC member uh, Bergen Perea. Hi, thank you. I just, well, I'm going to talk more about the extended footprint, actually, if we could put 
that slide back up, I'd appreciate it. Uh, the extended footprint at Clifton Court in that area. Um, first, though, I do want to say that I do agree with Anna Swenson's comments about <clears throat> flood concern. And Graham, I hear what you're saying in response. My question is on that issue, have you lined up your analysis with what has been created with the climate vulnerability assessment by the Delta Stewardship Council? So the, the climate vulnerability analysis, I have reviewed that. Um, in many cases, that's just looking at what the future, future heights of everything could be and what levees are gonna be overtopped from the system. Um, right. It's, you know, it's very much a, an overtopping event that, that we're talking about here in the future, future of, of water conditions around the Delta. Right. Um, we've assumed for, for design at this point, uh, we're using the, the hunt local 100 year surface with, within the Consumers River Channel and then projecting that very high level across to the Glanville track to design a hybrid temporary ring levy. So in my mind, I, I think in all of our minds, the ring levy is pretty doggone conservative in terms of its ability to, to protect and make sure that the, the drying RTM and all of the construction operations within it are isolated from any potential overland flooding. Um, beyond that, you know, as I said, we, we haven't accounted for the McCormick Williamson track, which is also going to help to bring levels down in the area. Yeah. So, there's a lot of different things, Barbara. I, I get what you're saying, and, and uh, there's a lot of different ways we could go with that. But just looking at the near-term uh, effects of, of during construction, we're, we're focused on, a, on sort of the current available information. I, I'm worried about what's going to be left at the end of construction. So I really do think that there has to be further analysis done on that point and conditions uh, compared to the climate vulnerability assessment. I understand the assessment goes out further in time, but you know, um, there are things that seem to be happening faster in relation to climate change than had been previously predicted. So um, I don't wanna bet on things being 30, 40 and 50 years out compared to a shorter near-term construction period. Um, back to this footprint, um, you know, we forget that there are people who live in this area. We've talked a lot about eminent domain as we should be and the impacts for farms and communities up at the north end of the Delta. But, you know, I was just thinking about some of my favorite families live off of Italian slough. Uh, we have people who live very close to this area. Um, it, I, because of the, the yellow areas, of course, are the construction impact areas. Uh, how are you looking at handling if people need to be relocated or farm property needs to be re relocated down here? Are you just working with the assumption that it's going to be all returned to them normal and it's just a temporary interruption? Or does this expand the eminent domain footprint? So are you talking about, Barbara, the area that's just inside the yellow, but not the red? Uh, yeah, because I, well, the yellow is like the expansion, correct? The yellow is the temporary construction area. Yeah. Permanent impact area. Yeah. I, and also, too, I mean, even where you don't have temporary yellow, the construction is going to be so intense down here. How far out are you looking at... Uh, using uh, eminent domain and is it a permanent eminent domain because the impacts are going to be so extreme for people in this area? Yeah, well, I think, well, first of all, I think that's a really good comment and question. I don't have answers for you right now, Barbara. Um, you know, I, I don't, we're not to that stage anyway. There's not even a project for all we know. You know, maybe there's this one, maybe it's Bethany. Uh, you know, we don't know. So at this point, we are focusing on the temporary and permanent uh, impact areas. And I can say that yes, we do have it accounted for in the environmental document to restore and rehabilitate those areas impacted during construction that are not part of the permanent footprint. And those would either be returned back to some form of productive agricultural use or habitat use. Um, so they would not be part of the permanent footprint. Okay. Um, that's what right. you can say from an engineering perspective. Barbara, I wanted to throw one other thing. I'm, I'm not sure I'm following you exactly, but what Graham showed you is a wasn't an expansion in the area we've been looking at. It was a fairly substantial reduction in the area footprint. 
that that's what it used to be and then that's what it is now yeah but you know okay i guess to me on the left side it looked like an ex well an expansion but let's whether you ex consider that an expansion or not living right up against that sure i get that <laughs> yeah it's still problematic yeah, and then there's absolutely a, and there's a second question to this, and I don't want to speak out of turn, and I hope uh, Chairman um, Jesus Tarango jumps in uh, here. I understand uh, from 2016 testimony that was given at the Water Board for Water Fix that there is an extensive footprint here for uh, plants that are used for cultural purposes and as medicine for tribes from throughout Northern California. I know tribes that are not in the SEC uh, use um, some of those native plants that are found in this area for their practices. Uh, it, you're changing things. You're showing me it's a reduction on one side. It looks like, you know, to me though, we still have the significant footprint. Um, have you done any analysis on that yet? Well, I think maybe I should take that question. Uh, so the tribal consultation is occurring through DWR. So it's a, a government to government practice. So right. we are consulting with tribes. Uh, we're consulting with about 15 tribes and, and very actively with about eight to 10. So we are working through all of the okay. potential footprint sites and the, the potential uh, concerns therein. But that's all a confidential process. It, I know it is a confidential process. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make I guess what I just want to say to you is that that is being considered and of course the the original village that was here what all the impacts are going to be on that um, it's just raising it as just support and ally for the tribes during that process then thank you thank you uh, I'd want to do a time check it is 412. Um, we do have uh, three other hands raised. We'll get to you in just a moment. I just wanted to note that part of this conversation has been Graham offering to have a deeper discussion about the, the ring levy, levy at uh, Twin Cities. So um, if you want to dig deeper in your questions, I suppose we can, but know that again, at a future meeting, there will be a more comprehensive discussion. So with that, um, the three hands that are up are Gil, CP, and Douglas. So SEC member Cosio. Valerie, I'm just gonna make one point here. Remember there is some of this, this is, this is laying the groundwork for future meeting information. Um, when, and then I think probably what would be really um, beneficial is some of those really specific concerns that people have if they email then maybe in that future meeting we can make sure that they are truly answered and and truly thought out carefully for um for for consideration okay go ahead i'm done no that's a great comment thank you uh sec member Cosio. thank you um in regard to the twin cities road uh, site um i think you need to look more and talk Get, talk to Sacramento County about that area because if you're talking about the 100 year flood, it's true that um, in 86 and 97, you know, the recent uh, big floods, that there was overland flow coming through the railroad. But if you actually look at the 100 year flood, um, it, it could be coming from other directions too. Uh, the RD1002 levy in the uh, Delta Levy Investment Strategy from 2017, they rated that as a 15 year level of protection. And in, in, in 2017, they did some major flood fighting on the uh, South Levy along Lost Slough and the West Levy along Snodgrass Sloughs. They almost lost it. So how do your flood, you're certainly gonna put a lot more pressure on it than, than what happened in, in 2017. And then Sacramento County's wrestling with FEMA on the flood elevations in that area and up to the Point Pleasant area. And we've been working with them on um, trying to get their maps revised. The problem is FEMA makes you consider the flooding from the Sacramento River, if you can believe that, because those levees are not rated uh, as, as FEMA certified levees either. So you got to be careful about the actual water that could be flooding and where it's coming from, the depth and that sort of thing, and dealing with Sacramento County and their um, flood insurance program, because if there's a big pimple in their uh, um, flooded area for 14 years, they may have some problems with FEMA. So just, just be on, on the alert to maybe work with uh, Sacramento County and their consultants to make sure that uh, they're good with whatever happens up there. 
Very good. Thank you, Gil. Um, I can say that <clears throat> just again, a little bit of a preview for the what we'll likely cover at a future meeting. We did see what you're talking about, that the flood water doesn't just originate as overtopping over the railroad embankment, um, and that it does sweep around from multiple directions and kind of loop around through Glenville track and, and come around. And so that that is, you know, we did see the same thing. The reconfiguration of the ring levy is intended to, to allow all of that to keep moving as it has historically, as it flows historically in, in shallow overland flooding. Um, so, but but yeah, I appreciate the comment and also the, the commentary about Sacramento County. Um, also, yeah, very, very good, very good point. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Graham. Uh, SEC member Jacoma. I just wanted to clarify the ring levy is temporary and will only be there during construction and then it will be removed. That's correct, TC. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. And that's uh, that's uh, the end of our questions. Chairwoman? Sarah, you are muted. Talking to myself, oh well. Okay, so uh, we're on item 5D and Nancy Parvizi is going to provide an update on the ongoing outreach efforts. So Nancy, could you please? Hi everyone. How are you? Sorry, I have to sit in my front yard, so hope the sun's not bothering. Um, Janet Barberi and I spoke a couple weeks ago about our ongoing outreach efforts and wanted to um, update folks. We actually had a small meeting in Hood yesterday. Um, grateful for the SEC members who have said to us several times, um, we're not sure that the folks who are actually living in Hood are getting the information or know much about the project and grateful to Gia and some others um, who helped identify some folks and we came out with our engineering team and kind of did a uh, sort of project 101 and really talked about the construction effects in Hood, some of the things we were working on. We heard a lot of folks is uh, concerns and a lot of information they have that we just wouldn't have uh, that comes about from day to day living. But want to say that it's a model that we've discussed. We've said over and over that if there are groups of folks that you feel are not hearing about the project or not getting the right info and would like um, further information, this is the time for us to be able to go out. Um, and we're more than happy to do it. We'll bring all the, uh, all the materials, we'll bring the screens, we'll bring internet connection if we need to. I know there's a lot of broadband issues, but um, it's a model that works really well. So thanks again to the folks who helped out with Hood. Um, and just wanted to let you know that going forward, we uh, look forward to doing more meetings like that. Yes. Uh, thank you to Gian. Thank you to Chief Welch for um, providing a space. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Hood could, could be part of that. Okay, so now we'll move on to item 5C. Uh, Janet Barbieri of the DWR will provide an update on the Community Benefits Program. So Janet, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, so let's see, there's the next, oh, move on to the next one. There we go. Yeah, just a couple of updates on some um, things that we've been working on. We talked earlier in this meeting about the environmental justice survey. So um, I don't know that there's too much more to say. I did put the link um, to the environmental justice space on the project website um, in the chat function. So um, folks um, have access to that. Um, it's the executive summary is also available in Spanish and um, you'll maybe recall uh, Genevieve Taylor um, and Juliana Burkhoff have presented information previously to this group. They're also available for presentations or briefings if any of your groups uh, or other groups that you're, you're, you work with or familiar with might be interested in learning more about the methodology or the findings. Um, so that's it on the environmental justice survey. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so on the community benefits program, um, we have concluded the first round of our community uh, workshops. So there were three public workshops and we also did a, um, a specific tribal member workshop. And so those are now finished. Materials um, are available on the website, including the presentations, the meeting videos, and then the meeting summaries. Um, the first one is up, the, the next two will be up very soon um, 
uh, on, on the project website. And I just wanted to remind folks that um, the department will use the input provided through the workshops, through the earlier interviews, any written comment that we've received um, to develop the framework that will be included as an appendix to the draft EIR. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about next steps, sort of what we're thinking the next steps might look like. So uh, I think let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, we will have this community benefits framework and the overall next steps we need to think about are how do we take the framework, which is really a concept, and turn that into a program, a finished you know, formalized final program. So I've just got a couple of slides here to talk about what we're thinking. Um, immediate next steps, uh, we know there needs to be a little bit more information and education um, for ourselves and for everyone. So what we're hoping to do is one, um, at least one more tribal workshop, um, just to make sure that we provide enough opportunity for thinking and discussion and collaboration um, with the tribes and tribal members. We're also contemplating doing a workshop, a public workshop um, on case studies, uh, different case studies for different types of projects and community benefits programs. Uh, we're still kind of working out how to do that, but we think it might be helpful to try to bring in people who have done this, who have experience in creating this type of program. And, um, you know, making a presentation and being available to answer questions. So we're going to work on um, on that. Hopefully something that we can pull off this fall would be the idea. Um, we do expect to do some informal querying, reaching out to folks, maybe doing some interviews, having some discussions, maybe having some meetings and looking for recommendations on um, the best way to do what I was saying before, which is take the framework and turn it into a program. Um, and so we know at a minimum there will have to be some level of outreach engagement to do that. That could be small group briefings, that could be continued community meetings, um, or it could be the or, you know, organization of a, of a group of some sort. But we're going to be looking for input on what people think is the best way to, to proceed with that. Next slide. Um, in terms of um, the objectives for that outreach and engagement, the idea really is to build consensus on the details of the program. When we first started this, um, in fact, you might, I don't know if you'll remember, but it was, it was a long time ago, but when we first uh, presented the concept to this group in December of last year, um, we said then, and um, have said all along and know to be true, that really a community benefits program needs to be driven by the community. So building consensus on the details of the program is really, really important. So some of the questions that we need to answer are things like, how should a Delta fund be set up? Who should administer such a fund? How should Delta fund projects be prioritized? Um, what specific economic development commitments should DWR and the participating public water agencies make with regard to local business preferences or targeted hiring or dual purpose infrastructure? And what should the implementation plan look like? Next slide. So um, there, these, these are the steps, the very general steps, the information and education um, starting now, um, outreach to try to build consensus, the, the, the slide that I just talked about. Um, and then that would be at some point before the final EIR is approved. I just wanted to give a little bit of a frame of reference. We're not talking about trying to do that right now. We've got a little bit of time on that. Um, we, we would want to find some way to obviously memorialize that consensus, and that can take many different forms and shapes. That would be at some point after project approval. And then, of course, there would be implementation of community, a community benefits program, and that would be concurrent with the start of project implementation. And there are a couple of little notes at the bottom. I just wanted to make really clear that um, the outreach and engagement, that effort, um, and we, we try to say this all the time, but it, it doesn't help to restate it, that engagement does not imply project support. We're very clear in understanding that aspect. People have, have said that that's a concern, and so we want to make that clear. Um, the second thing, the second little um, note at the bottom is that implementation, of course, would only happen if there's an approved project. They're not really independent of each other in that regard. So I think I have 
one more slide. Yes, so the other thing I wanted to um, update you on is we are planning on doing some informational webinars. Um, you may have seen an e-blast from us in the last couple of weeks on this. Um, there are four informational webinars. Um, the idea is to provide some background information about how the draft EIR is being prepared. Um, and so I wanna make really clear that this is not part of the formal sort of CEQA process, but it is intended to be helpful. It's intended to, to um, provide information as a lead up to, as Carrie was saying before, when the draft EIR is released mid next year. We thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about how the technical staff are approaching that work, um, how they're approaching doing the analyses. Uh, what are the methodologies? What are the assumptions used in conducting, conducting those impact analyses? So there's four workshops. Um, the first one's on July 14th. That's on operations of the State Water Project and Delta Conveyance. Uh, August 3rd is on fisheries. August 25th is on climate change. And September 16th is on environmental justice. And I think I have one more slide that shows, yeah. So this is just a clip of something that's available on our website. So I don't want you to think that you, know, you have to, because I know that font is really small, but this is just a little cutout of a flyer that we're posting around town in our normal places, post offices, et cetera, libraries. Um, it's also available on the website. It's in English and Spanish, but it does have a little bit more information about um, sort of the highlights of what we are hoping to go into for each one of the workshops. So I think that is the, that's the end of my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. Um, we do have uh, Anna's uh, SEC Sw member Swenson's hand up. She was up actually right after Nasley's uh, presentation. So Anna. So um, thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank Nasley and um, Gia for organizing um, that meeting in Hood. I think that was really, really important. And um, if I had my dithers, I would ask you guys to do it one more time but I'm really happy that Hood got um, <clears throat> some time and some and some you know direct information and I was wondering if anyone was going to do like a synopsis of the data that you guys collected from the landowners in Hood and if there was a way that we could um, like that could be distributed to us I'm really interested to, see, to hear what the folks in Hood um, what their concerns are and and you know whatnot so and thank you so very much and the this I agree with Barbara about that this other survey would be nice to see the the results even if they're in an anonymous you know confidential way so thank you and Anna I think on the note of the privacy and synopsis let me think on that because um, and thanks to you Anna because you were the first person who really brought up hood um, and introduced us to Gia and got um, really broad attention to the fact that there's folks there who just don't, weren't hearing things. So I'm grateful for your involvement as well. Um, you know, we made a point to say the meeting's not being recorded. It is tricky, I think, for some folks to show up to stuff. We also always say, like, showing up doesn't mean that you're, we're trying to change your minds on the project or that we're trying to get your support. We kind of understand where things are. We just think we owe you accurate information and explanations about what's happening and you make up your own minds. But, um, I think we were trying to be very careful about um, uh, sort of who shows up to these meetings. Again, we're generally trying to be very transparent, but sometimes people come and don't want to kind of know other folks are there. And I don't sort of know how to say that other than like that. Um, I don't know the internal politics of every place other than there are some internal politics. But that said, I think that we can always come up with a summary similar to what we do for the SEC and keep out people's names and things like that. Um, and you know, talk about some of the things that came up. Um, but let me discuss that with the team and come back to you with that. And specifically, Nasley, what I'm asking mm -hmm. about is a marshy area that maybe was unidentified um, prior yeah. to that. Yeah. And like, you know, that I think, I guess what I want to see is that like, get rolled into the tracking, get rolled in so that we don't do um, public outreach and then not you yeah. know, act on things that could be a red flag. So yeah, yeah. thank you, Nasley. Appreciate you. Thanks, Anna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, we also have one other hand up, uh, oh, two other hands up. SEC member Glosky. 
Thank you. Uh, regarding the benefits discussion, is there a category where you're able to keep track of, or have you looked at um, the possibility for the project itself to give benefits to the community? And it ties back to, you know, the emergency response again. So, you know, South Delta water users, if there's a problem with a levee and the salt water intrudes, and you're able to reduce the time that the salt water's around and it increases or decreases the time that they're without their water source for their farm or something like that. I mean, that's, that's a benefit to the community. And, you know, water uh, clarity and quality around Discovery Bay could be a benefit. Is, are any of those that are, you know, less monetary based in budget items, but are still benefits? Are they presented somewhere or discussed somewhere? Well, I guess I can, I can try to answer that a bit. So to me, a lot of those types of things are included in a category that I'm going to forget what we're calling it right now, but something like implementation commitments. So the idea that there may be uh, multiple benefits associated with facilities that we are working to install as part of this project. And I think that that more often comes up related to internet. You know, that's something that we talk about a lot where there will be uh, internet coming into the new intakes, for example, and it is possible that, that there could be an easy way to interconnect to other nearby communities. And so the, the facility that's coming in could provide this alternate benefit. But I think, David, the types of things that you're talking about fall into that category as well. You know, are there ways that the facilities could provide other types of benefits? So I certainly think that that's something that fits into that type of category for discussion. Great. Yeah, it would be, I mean, it's something that should be presented. It's a community benefit. So I don't, I mean, I think it should be there. Okay. Um, as you see, member Moran. <laughs> Moran. Yeah, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, just a question regarding uh, naming. Uh, on the slide, we have the Delta Fund. It's capitalized. Um, has it been decided that there is a Delta Fund and it's officially named the Delta Fund? Well, none of it is official because it's okay. still conceptual. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But we just wanted to acknowledge that if there was a fund, it would have a name probably. And okay. we just wanted to, you know, um, just recognize that, you know, that's what we're calling it for now. But you know, who knows, it could be called something else. Okay, uh, it, do, it does lend an air of, of a decision that's already been made. Mm -hmm. When we call it, when we give it a proper name like that. So just something to consider if you would, please. That yeah, is. maybe instead of the, it's ah, but oh, th good exactly. point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for clarifying that, Mike. Yeah. Okay, SEC member uh, Shia. Yeah. Um, well, I'm always a big advocate of uh, raising the protection level of the levees in the Delta. So um, I, I just hope, I just want to make, make sure that this item will either be inside the community benefit uh, program or a precondition of building the tunnel. So I just want to put that into the record. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. So uh, that is one of the categories of project types that we heard during some of the workshops and some of the interviews, and it is something that we're thinking about as uh, based on the feedback that we've we've heard as part of a fund, not yeah. the fund. Just, a just fund. now, when I saw the even the the rain levy rain levy is the hundred year uh, protection level, and yet most of the levy in the delta are way be, way below that protection level. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I do want to clarify, though, that, that largely what we're looking at now are the types of things that could be included in a fund. There really are no decisions yet about what would be in and out. And that is the type of thing that we'd like to be working with the communities to try to refine as we move forward. Okay. But it is on the list of types of projects. Great. Thank you so much. And just a quick time check. It is 4.33. Uh, Barbara Bergen Priya, I see you have your uh, your hand up. Um, I hope we could add to that. I think the idea about levy protection is good for community benefits. Um, <clears throat> I think it'd be very good to consider putting in an expanded fund for HABs mitigation and HABs tracking and testing. Um, 
we the water boards are not adequately funded to get the job done. Um, I think that regulating around HABs should be a part of um, water rights conditions. That's probably separate from a community benefit fund. I don't think you could get that in there. But I, I do think there has to be uh, a commitment made to uh, mitigation and tracking and testing um, and setting up independent uh, groups throughout the Delta to do some of that work to kind of double back and really localize it and make sure that it's um, that the work that's being done while you're working on the project has integrity that can be verified uh, by EPA certified citizen scientists to make sure that water quality is protected. <clears throat> I also think that you need to think through in community benefits protections for the 76 small, as I think it's 76 small drinking water systems um, that are tied to the Delta. Uh, what's water quality going to be like for those communities? Um, I hope that there's going to be more focus on that than um, shiny plaques with buildings, uh, because once your water quality is gone, it's all over. Um, and flood threat because of protection for people. So um, I just really hope we get to keep it to the basics. Real quick question for Janet about the, the webinars that are coming up and even like the meeting you did with Hood uh, and some other smaller meetings you're doing. Are, is this going in the bucket for um, community outreach for the EIR? Kind of like a scope, part of the scoping process? Well, like I was saying before, it's not, you know, like it's not an official requirement of CEQA, but we do try to, you know, when we describe all of the outreach we're doing, we try to be pretty comprehensive in it. So if you mean, okay. is it going in the bucket? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's something we're trying to do to okay. provide information. Yeah. Okay. 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 And we have a couple other uh, hands that have gone up. Uh, SEC member Moreno. Hi, um, so I just wanted to kind of, uh, I guess, piggyback off of what Doug and what Barbara were saying. Uh, there are some things, you know, like like infrastructure, like the levees and the drinking water that I feel like maybe shouldn't be part of just the community benefit fund, but, but should be something that's part of, that's like not optional. Like these are things that, that have to be mandatory um, that are worked on before the tunnel gets built or as the tunnel is getting built uh, because I feel like community benefit fund it seems kind of like um, that those things can be taken away if it doesn't work out or if there's you know quote unquote not enough funding in for the community benefits but things like the infrastructure and you know water quality are super important and they need to be addressed before anything else I think uh, happens. So I do want to talk just a little bit based on your comment, Tia, about the difference between environmental mitigation and community benefits. So in the EIR, we will be looking at the effects of the proposed project and the alternatives. And if they, there are significant effects, we have to identify mitigation measures and then we would need to implement those as sort of a basis of part of the project. Uh, but there may be things where there is an existing problem we would not be affecting that existing problem. So we would not be proposing to fix it. So, I mean, a good example of that is some different areas of levees that may be um, maybe not as, as advanced as people might like. If we aren't doing construction in that area, if there's not a project component in that area, that's not a piece that we would be affecting. So it wouldn't be a project effect or a mitigation measure, but it could be included as part of the community benefits program. So that's sort of one of the things we talked about where CEQA is pretty specific about how to analyze impacts and mitigation. You know, we're really just looking at the types of environmental impacts caused by the project. And then mitigation is really just focused on those effects. So I hope that helps a little. Yes, thank you. I, but what about, um, and I think we kind of touched on it maybe last night about um, if something, if we, if you don't anticipate something, 
Um, but it happens later on. Is there going to be a way to fix that? Like, or, um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll probably turn this over to, to Graham a bit, but generally, you know, our first objective in the EIR is to do our best to identify, disclose, and mitigate effects. Uh, we have heard concerns that we may miss something we, we know it's possible, although it's certainly our objective to try to avoid that and identify everything. But that is why we're talking about an ombudsman program. And so, Graham, maybe you can talk about that a little. Sure. So the, the ombudsman program uh, would be <clears throat> essentially putting a person, point of contact in place who's familiar with the community, understands the program, and is the single point of con contact for any issues that might develop. So if there's something that's going wrong as, as the project is being constructed, uh, it doesn't put people in sort of a black hole of sending messages and trying to figure out who to inform and, and how to get answers and how to get progress on an issue. It puts a person in charge of that who, who is easily reachable and is um, whose sole responsibility is to be responsive to any of those issues that might come up and to facilitate resolution in, in, a, in a, you know, as quick a possible way so that things don't languish and, and drag on. So that's, that's a program that, that uh, would be run by the DCA uh, as the entity in charge of, of design and construction and it would be a direct pipeline to try and uh, make those connections and, and come to resolution. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Gia, for the question. It's always good to re remind everyone about, uh, about the difference between uh, mitigations and community benefits as well as the fact that we're looking at um, uh, the types of programs that, uh, like the ombudsman program that uh, is being discussed. Uh, SEC member Cosio. Yeah, just a quick comment about these workshops. Um, the first one titled uh, Operations of the State Water Project and Delta Conveyance. Um, since the operation of the tunnels, intakes and tunnels is not part of this project, um, this may lead people to think that they're going to be carrying that sort of thing when they're not. So it's a little bit disingenuous to title it that way because there really is no, you guys aren't looking at the actual operations at this point. So just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you. Um, and we, we are, um, we have been trying to um, make clear and we could probably always do a better job, but um, we're not talking about um, actually having results of impact analyses right now. We're really just trying to set the foundation. Um, so we'll, we'll try to really stress that so people understand what we're, what we're doing in the workshops and what we're not doing. Okay, thanks, Janet. And thanks for the clarifying question, uh, Gil. All right, uh, Chairwoman, we are back. Okay, here we go. All right, now we're going to open this up for public comment. Are there any public comments on the items for um, item number five? I don't believe we have any for item number five. Okay, then we're going to get on to item number six, which is the future agenda items and the next meeting. And, and looking forward, the items on the slide um, basically uh, note what we're planning for the next meeting. It's currently set for September 22nd. And as we've indicated in the past, when we think we can skip a meeting, we will out of respect for your time. And of course, we're not really meeting for the rest of the summer because everybody has many things going on in the summer. Um, also for September and beyond, we continue to ask you to consider topics for future agenda items. And so the items we're anticipating for September are the following. The uh, community be uh, benefits framework, the engineering updates and the subsurface investigation updates. And then today uh, we discussed some things that were on the, uh, some of the design changes that people wanted to see elucidated. So I think that, that Graham, we can, we can kind of take a look at some of those and bring that into future items as well, because there was definitely an interest. Okay, uh, now on to item number seven. We've got the uh, non-agendized SEC questions or comments. So it's the time for SEC members to provide information about outreach or questions raised related to the proposed project and any other items you feel you haven't been able to bring up during this meeting. So these are for non-agendized SEC questions. Great. Uh, and we do have SEC member Swenson's hand up. Go ahead. Um, 
I just feel obligated to say this because of the recent curtailment notices that our farmers have received um, and because of the severe drought. Um, I still oppose this project and I really think that we should be focusing on technology and ideas that are not as old or older than me. We are supposed to be the green leader technology. We're supposed to fix our infrastructure before we build more. We really need to focus on that aqueduct and the fact that it's on a fault and it's subsiding and it's losing 30% of the water that flows down it every single day that would, could be put to good use by farmers who would desperately take it at this moment. And so, um, and with the current, current price tag that I know is gonna go up because I just got back from Home Depot this afternoon and paid ungodly amounts for wood. So I just, um, I just really, I just wanna make sure that I say that every single meeting. Like we, we really need to look at this project and say, are we really getting all the bang for the buck that we could get for the price tag of this project? And what else could we do that maybe would fix and, and benefit more people, not just a few, and would not harm the Delta and take away this treasure that, that just quietly sits out here in California. So thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Go ahead, Valerie. Uh, yes, we have uh, SEC member Shia. Your hand is up. Yep. Okay, I'm going back to the uh, just now we're talking about the South Delta connection and um, uh, connecting our uh, the, the DCA facility to the federal facility. It seems to me that it comes out as an afterthought. I mean, wh why, why wasn't this um, considered in the very first place? Well, do you want me to answer this, Valerie? Uh, that would be terrific. I was uh, I was drawing straws between you and Carrie, but go ahead, Graham. Okay, um, Douglas. When you say first place, do you mean when we started the SEC and we started going through the various details of the project? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so it was included at that time, Douglas. We've just always spent most of our time talking about the six thousand CFS project alternative. We also haven't dedicated any energy really within this group talking about the 3,000 or 4,500 CFS configuration, nor have we really spent any time talking about the 7,500. Um, it, it's always been there, Douglas. It's okay. one of the, the suite of alternatives. Yeah. Being All right. Okay, thank you. Sure. Great, and thanks for that clarification. Any other hands up, questions, comments? Uh, mine was up. Oh, Barbara, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Thank you for, for raising it. <laughs> I really don't have the dots either. Uh, I looked. <laughs> don't know where they went this week. Um, so quest, just to piggyback a little bit on Anna, uh, I think Anna and I have always kind of handled how we talk about things in this meeting a little bit differently. Um, I respect my dear friend in the North Delta very, very much. She's always raised the issue of opposition. I've kept the opposition, I think, a little bit more quiet at the meetings, and I leave it for other work. But I have to tell you, it isn't just the curtailment notices. Restore the Delta, when, it gave, when we gave our testimony in 2016 for water fix, we raised all the issues about evaporation in the Sierra, about parched lands soaking up uh, runoff at extremely rapid rates. And it has really stuck with me this last month that if our scrappy little group of policy people, citizen scientists, and, and grassroots analysts could predict that this was going to happen in 2016. And that DWR frankly mismanaged the predictions and the analysis when letting water out of the system uh, this spring. That my, I feel like my goodwill has really, really just been tapped out um, for the process. Uh, I cannot 
uh, think how we justify this project if this drought stretches on as long as some people have predicted it will. And I fear that so much time and so many resources are being sucked up for this in our state institutions, in our public water districts, when we have real serious on the ground challenges that are only going to get worse the next year or two. And so, um, you know, it's easy to pop in if the meetings are gonna be less frequent, but, um, you know, until there are real serious discussions about operations and the realities of climate change and drought, um, I just I just don't have much more faith in the collaborative process at this point, because what happened this spring really points to something, and, and what's happening with harmful algal blooms is that when we do give you information in good faith, the institutions don't take us seriously. We may not be the powerful people, but we're very smart people. And so I really hope, um, I hope we, we see some changes. I hope we see some changes in immediate operations. I hope we see some changes in not running processes to check off boxes. But as you produce that EIR, the real questions have to be answered because we are just wasting time in California, precious time. And we're gonna be in trouble before there's one shovel full of dirt turned for the project. That's it. Okay. Um, thank you for your comments, uh, Barbara. Uh, Carrie, did you wanna comment? Yeah, I guess a few things. I, I guess I, I wanted to start by saying this really is not a check the box exercise to us or to me. You know, this is something that is very important to me. It's why we, we put a lot of time into this effort because to me, the time I spend here talking to you is, is clearly the most important part of my job. Uh, we aren't doing this just to, to check the box and try to, to, to be shallow about this. And I also understand the sort of continued frustration that Delta Conveyance is only a small piece of the overall water picture that there are so many other things going on right now um, related to the water quality control plan and uh, other preparations like Delta ADAPTS at Delta Stewardship Council. There are so many different efforts that it is hard to sort of keep up with them and understand who fits or what issue fits into sort of what process. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that I know are, are very deep and serious concerns and, and um, you know, have maybe one of them that that, that certainly is an issue to us in terms of how we affect that, but sort of addressing that is outside the scope of our specific project. So we're very concerned and we take it very seriously, but solving that problem is outside the scope of this specific prob project, which I know is an extremely frustrating answer, but uh, that's, that's sort of the position we're in right now. Uh, that said, we are working also as part of the next steps, like in the technical workshops, we're really trying to talk about climate change and how we think it could uh, be functioning in the future and how we're taking that into our account and analysis. That's one of the technical workshops that's coming in August. And we are uh, continuing to think about how to incorporate that and how to think about it in terms of the future. And all I can say is, Barbara, we really appreciate your participation. So uh, we do take your input very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Okay. You know what, I just want to say thank you. I, when I talk about it, it's not personal with any of you, not at all. So I, I just want to make that clear. It, to me, it's about a switch in an institutional zeitgeist. And that isn't just one person. I, I, I'm just deeply concerned that California is coming up for a very hard reckoning. Yeah. All of us. Well, Barbara, your thoughtful comments are, are truly, um, truly valued here because they, they always are quite thoughtful and uh, you, you get to the point. Okay, so any any more Valerie? Yes, uh, SEC member Moran. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, 
you know, these presentations that we've had over Zoom have been pretty remarkable. I'm pretty astounded at how much information we could see and the graphics that you provided, the commentary we've heard over the past 15 months about the project have really been great. Just before COVID hit, we had discussed bus tours, site visits, and things like that. And although we've learned an awful lot since in that last 15 months, and maybe some folks feel it may not be as valuable as they once were, there's a lot of abstraction still in my mind. And I've been working out there for 25 years. Um, and so if that's something that folks would consider, I just want to throw it out there. It's something that I would definitely be interested in. You know, Nasley and everybody else has put a lot of work into doing these driving tours, and those were really good. Um, but it sure would be great to have um, the DCA crew and the SEC folks out at the same time to get that really valuable interaction on site that would help turn a lot of these abstractions into something a little more reality-based upon which we can make decisions and directions. Just a suggestion. Uh, Nasli, are you still on? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to address that? No, I think it's great feedback, Mike. Um, maybe what we can do is kind of survey folks and see what their comfort level is. Um, you know, it's funny, the door, the sign's been flipped to open and some people are ready to go through the door and others aren't. Um, the driving tour is actually a great idea though, because uh, last time we did it, folks kind of came in there, we kind of caravaned it. Um, and we could think of doing something like that again, if you think it would be helpful. Um, similar to the virtual tours that we have online, which is essentially what the tours would be. I think it would be really hard to do the whole thing in a day, but we could break it up and yeah, see if there's interest and see if folks would like to come along. And I, I know that uh, previously there was a, a an intakes field trip. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that a lot of people didn't make it, couldn't make it. That might be something to uh, to, to look at once more, um, because I know that, especially now with more information, a lot of people have really expressed an interest. Yeah, I mean, when we tried to do, when we want to do the tours before, is getting everyone on a bus, because um, it's actually quite hard to stop, and it's easier to kind of drive along the route and be able to speak. Um, so again, we could think about doing a caravan um, with walkie-talkies, I've done that with our staff, uh, or we can um, see if folks feel comfortable, we can rent a small bus and do a trip like that. Thanks, Mike. I just want to give the testimonial that last time we went to uh, the, the tunnel work in Santa Clara County. Yes, Douglas. I, I was escorted by three, three staff of DCA. So that was, uh, and it was just me, me and three DCA staff. So um, that was pretty uh, VIP treatment. <laughs> we were hoping a lot more folks would show up, but it was lovely, Douglas. Um, and it's funny, Douglas, now that you mentioned it, because they were closing up. Um, I just don't know. We, it was so soon uh, before uh, lockdown, um, but it might be possible to kind of revisit that uh, that site in the uh, in the fall um, if folks wanted to get a sense of what it's like to have a tunneling operation under you and to kind of go into a tunnel. Um, we'd be happy to reach out to them again if more folks were interested in seeing that. It's a, it's a smaller operation, it was a 13 foot diameter tunnel, um, but I think still helpful for folks to, to put their eyes on it and sort of stand above ground while there's a tunnel being dug underneath. And I mean, yeah, that was a very insightful tour and uh, it definitely opened my eyes yeah. in all senses. That size tunnel too is, is the one that is potentially proposed for uh, an intertie with the, um, with the Delta Mendonca, Mendonca Canal with the, with the beds, so give us a good idea. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Well, uh, that's a little homework for, for the DCA to do. Um, SEC member Lytle. Hey, thank you. Um, one question. I'm not certain. Um, you know, I, I love jumping on this, uh, these meetings every time, but I, I, I think I miss the in-person ones even more. And so I think that uh, hopefully by September, we would be able to orchestrate uh, additional meetings in person. Uh, because I think 
early on the impact of meeting in the Delta, truly understanding where you're at, what's going on was very helpful to everyone. Kind of keeps you, your mind in the right place. Um, also, I like to support Barbara's comments. I think that uh, where, where I think the locals here in the Delta are very intently interacting and trying to relay their concerns regarding this project. The operations of the state and federal projects move on. And particularly in another year of uh, lower water levels, in my opinion, um, the drought didn't end in 2016-17. Uh, this is a perpetuation of the original drought that started in 2010. Um, because the Colorado system is still under the same drought conditions and were back then. Anyway, um, city of Stockton itself is becoming increasingly frustrated. Uh, we continue to have uh, issues with HABs. Uh, we're looking at a, a probably a record in impact year regarding that issue. Um, I have met with the Regional Water Board about it. Um, they're very, very uh, limited in funding, uh, in developing programs that could help locals uh, help manage uh, this type of issue. It's, it's usually just a uh, uh, essentially it's sort of a fire drill. All of a sudden you'll have somebody take a, a measurement of uh, cyanobacteria and maybe the deep water channel or somewhere in and around Stockton and every the fire drill goes off. And But yet there's no program. There's no long-term effort. There's no anything. It's just, you know, let's go light everybody's hair on fire and then run away. And so it continues to be a, a very, very frustrating thing for us. Uh, we're very concerned about water, water supply. We're trying to manage the groundwater basin. We're trying to work hard on that. But at the same time, the state water board now is challenging uh, one, our Delta water right application. And we have a status hearing next month on July 15th regarding part B of our application. And so we feel like we're kind of getting pinched in multiple areas. And uh, seriously, it really jeopardizes our, our interest in wanting to try to work collaboratively with the DCA on these types of things. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mel. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, two people to uh, just kind of raise again, Carrie, if you want to address uh, Mel's uh, comments and then either Graham or Josh, if you can address the location component for uh, uh, our meeting in September. So, Carrie? I, I think that, that largely we sort of talked about these issues and Barbara brought them up and I appreciate that they are certainly very important priorities for Stockton and, and thanks for going over them. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I think that the answer is pretty much the same for me. Okay, agreed. Uh, let's see, Josh or uh, Graham? Josh, did you want to start it out? We have someone oh. else other than Josh, I believe, at the moment. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, thought, I thought Josh was here. I'm uh, sorry, Ann, do you want to go ahead? Annie. Annie, sorry. That's, that's okay. So, yes, can you, can you uh, repeat what the input is that you need? from me i was i was following but no the the, the the comment was that it would be great to get together and do our meetings in person they're impactful they're in the delta there's a lot of benefit to that um so you know this may be uh from a there's there's the law and then there's the policy dynamic i think we're still in flux uh i believe this was addressed earlier a little bit with regard to um the uh, Brown Act dynamic. Do you want to address the Brown Act dynamic one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So the current executive order that came out when the state reopened June 15th says that there's 
essentially a grace period for the Brown Act modifications that were in place during COVID to phase out. So by September 30th, all public agencies, including the DCA, will be expected to go back to pre-existing Brown Act model. So um, you can still have some teleconferencing, but you know, you'll know you have to do special noticing and things like that. In terms of wanting to get together, that's basically a policy call at this point. So um, there are no restrictions statewide anymore or locally. So if if that's something that people wanted to organize, that's totally doable and people can choose, you know, of course, based on their risk level, if they would like to attend or not. But there's there's no reason that that you guys can't have a public event or um, an event that is open to anyone who wants to come, if that makes sense. And I know that there's uh, a lot of changes that continue to happen and September is a yes. ways away. So why don't we put a pin in that, perhaps, Graham? And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to, you know, and and Chair uh, Palmer as well. This may be one of those things that we determine closer to September. Let's let's determine that closer to September because one of the things is um, as of the 15th we just opened up again, and July 4th is coming up. I think one of the things that we do need to keep an eye from, and and I used to be working in public health, so uh, so yes, we we need to maybe look and see what happens and and there may be other guidelines coming up and then maybe we are all clear and things are just smooth sailing from this point on but i think we're going to be able to know that within the next month sure. so thank thank you i, I agree dr lyle i mean I, I know you made the comment that i think we all get a lot of benefit from being together and and um at a location in the delta to kind of keep all of our head all of our heads in, in the right place and, and focus so I think I, I agree. We're just going to have to wait and see. And as we get closer, we can check with everybody and, and again continue to gauge comfort levels, take a look at what's going on around us with respect to, to um, progression, and, and make sure things are, are heading in the right direction and it's safe to have a meeting like that. But I think it would be nice. Okay. Awesome. All I right. Um, we do have one more hand up. That would be Co-Chair Barbara Keegan. Thank you. Well, you know, first, I just would really like to thank everyone for their authenticity in this meeting today. I think that it was um, really important, some of the things that we heard from committee members. And I really um, want to compliment Ms. Buckman for her, um, her ability to really listen and not be defensive and understand where people's comments are coming from. So I, I think that it, that's really important. And I also just wanted to um, add that I, I do think that there's um, value uh, to having meetings in the Delta. Um, having face-to-face -face meetings creates connections and it also allows those of us who you know, aren't in the Delta on a day-to-day -day basis to have the opportunity to get reminded again of the environment and, and what we're really talking about. Um, so, Thank you everyone very much. I realize it's going to be a, a, a slow process before we get to that point where we have in-person meetings. We want to protect everyone's health and safety. Um, but I continue to be impressed um, by our staff and by uh, the, the SEC members because I um, I don't know what to say other than I'm, I'm very impressed. It's a quality group of people and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Well said. I believe that's uh, that locks up item seven. Okay, now we're on to item eight and this is for public comment. And so we'll now do the public comment on the non-agendized items. And Ms. Martinez, have we received any public comments? I believe we have. We have someone, I believe it's Osha Missouri, who uh, it would like to speak on item eight. That is right now. Yes. Okay. Jasmine, you want to, or Jennifer, do you want to? There it is. And then she needs to be unmuted. Okay, Osha, we're good to go. Go ahead. Oh, that is fancy. Very nice. All right, Osha, go ahead. Osha, have you unmuted yourself? Hold on, can we stop the clock? Don't, don't do the clock until she's ready. Right. She was having some problems with hooking up in the past, so maybe she just has to get the... Uh, okay, Osha? 
Osha, I have allowed you to speak. I see that you're there. And it looks like you're unmuted. Hello? Hi there, Osha. There you are. Hi. Sorry, I, I did unmute when the thing came up. Um, it's kind of hard to hear you, though. You may need to speak up or speak into your microphone a little bit more. Okay. Um, how about this? That's better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know how to turn on my camera. Otherwise, I'd say hello. Um, but um, just wanted to comment on a couple of items. First of all, um, really want to agree with what um, Barbara Berger Perilla and, and Mel Lytle and others are saying about the capacity of the state to focus on solutions and the way that the tunnel project really takes away from that overall capacity. I understand Ms. Buckman's point that, you know, this project isn't trying to solve all issues, but I think um, being somebody who's spent, you know, 10 plus years talking about a tunnel or something like it, you know, I wish I could have spent that time talking about all the other solutions that are out there to address uh, water supply reliability and sustainability in a lot better ways that don't create the kind of impacts that um, we've been talking about in these meetings. So, um, you know, I, I really think there is a, a larger policy issue that all of us are responsible for to keep moving toward those other solutions. And especially in a year like this year, I think it gets highlighted that, you know, this having big diversions at the top of the delta is is not going to resolve these these issues and we need to have a much more you know portfolio watershed based approach um, in order to have you know a better future in california um, the tunnel is is not getting us there um, the other thing i wanted to point out at the beginning of the meeting you know the format was discussed and you guys kind of went back on that and i guess you know, I understand the Brown Act um, requirements and it, I, as someone who's helped organize public meetings, yes, it's very awkward to say, oh yeah, you know, my home is open to the public. We can't do that to our SEC members or to the staff here. Um, I do think there may be an opportunity for SEC to advocate alongside other public agencies for some kind of hybrid accommodation because I think that having the ability to allow remote participation in some manner that doesn't detract from the in-person meeting is something that is a benefit and is kind of like one of the silver linings of the pandemic. And so I would encourage, you know, your executive director and others who are in that kind of policy position to look for ways to try to preserve a remote meeting option for those who prefer it, because I think it, it is beneficial, um, even though we all, you know, even I miss in-person meetings, which I never thought I would say. But <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, all right well thank you so much i believe that's the only public comment we had today okay so we are now um, coming to the end of our meeting and thank you osha for for providing that public comment um our next meeting as noted will be september 22nd at 3 p.m at this point it's going to be on ring central but keep posted we may we'll see what, what happens and so um other than that, I hope you guys all stay safe. Uh, wear your sunscreen. Go on out there and have a have a great summer with your families and and friends. And um, yeah, thank you so much. We are now adjourned. Have thank you, day. everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Great to meet you all. Bye.